Welcome to TJN TV and Tuesday Night with Ben Stowe. Now introducing the one and only Ben Stowe. Yeah, baby. Yeah. Good evening and welcome to Tuesday Night with Ben Stowe. This is the place where you do not have to listen to Jack Black sing Ben's name over and over in a very agonizing love song. That's a reference to Peaches, by the way, Ben, if you haven't heard it oh, yet. Oh, missed it totally, yeah, so. <sighs> well, if you haven't heard it, go listen to Peaches by Jack Black. I was like, Jack Black sang a song about me? That's <laughs> well, that, he's saying about Peaches, but, you know, if it would be your name, and you know, one will have to hear that agonizing love song. Doesn't Jack know that Peaches come from a can? Uh, he he put there by a man in a factory You would think he would know that, but no, he's, he's you know, he's sharing, guy. I mean, sharing he's his love guy. for the Mario... Princess Peach. Oh, yeah, I did hear vaguely about that. Yeah, yes. yeah. Well, now you know I don't get out much. Yeah, yeah. That, you're too busy working all the time, but someday they're going to let speaking you. Speaking of not getting out much, I, I was just reading the news before I did the show, and that's uh -huh. something I do more than I should probably, but uh, I like to be caught up on things. And I just saw that the actress who did the green jello scene in Jurassic Park is has just recreated the scene, and she's now 43. Okay. Which blows my mind because that makes her very close to my age. And I just, I mean, you know, wait, she's the little girl with the green jello scene, but, but I get, apparently that was 30 years ago. I don't know. I, I mean, hmm. who knew? <laughs> How time flies. That's what I was thinking. I'm like, wait a minute. The little girl from Jurassic Park is like that in the window of dateability for me. I mean, if I wasn't happily married, I'm like, you know, that's like... <laughs> Doesn't, I could have been having seem right. green jello. What's up? No. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I just, and by the way, music lovers, I'm sure there's one or two on this show. If not, you know, be sure to catch uh, Howie and Jay afterwards. But uh, I actually have a green jello CD. Oh. From the 90s, so. And that, that's the actual. I mean, I, I think it's somewhere in the C, or C, uh, the CD, cassette singles I had. Uh, and what was their what was their big song that they... Three little pigs. Three little pigs down. There we go. Little yeah. pig, little, little pig. pig yeah. Let me in. yeah, that was that's what I got. Yeah. I had a, a cassette single of that because we played it so much, like once. Yeah, I actually have a green Jello CD, not wow. green jellies. Wow, that's that's really not that you know not that valuable. You're not going to be able to retire off the proceeds. Yeah, it's probably that. worth five or six dollars. Yeah, um, sure. <laughs> no <laughs> maybe not all right um so tonight maybe it's worth that to the actress who played in Jurassic Park. exactly you know here, here see this yeah well, you can and i'll even sign it that's right <laughs> it'll be great so tonight gang we're going to talk about speakers speaker placement because as people are getting out and doing shows and they're showing pictures and saying hey look at my system give me some feedback but don't say anything mean or don't point out any of my problems just say good things Pretty much that's what people are saying. I mean, I kind of read between the lines in those last few parts of it. It sounds like give me affirmation, right? And pretty I mean, much. You know, that's what they're so. after. But in reality, there's times where you look at something and it's like, okay, your intention is good. Your intentionality is fabulous. But then there's this reality thing. And we always have to come back to the, the, the idea of making sound and making good sound. Well, I, if you came here for affirmation, you probably came to the wrong place. I just had a really good but forthright meeting about it was about concert safety procedures and i won't get into the you know all the you know details but uh one of the numerous participants in the meeting uh the conference call texted me during the call and said that's what i love about you right to the point <laughs> so if you've come for answers you've come to the right place if you've come for affirmation i i won't promise that i think that my the best way for me to serve you, the best way for me to be useful to you is to tell you the truth. Very much so. And that's what we're into tonight. Da -da -da, without Jack Black. So if I hurt your feelings. Ice cream I'm, solves a lot of problems. I'm just that's saying. Right. Go have some ice cream Go and get over cream. it and come back and make better sound, right? You know, like it's not personal. We can still be friends. I love you all. I, that's why I'm taking the time on my Tuesday night, uh, instead of reading more articles about 30 year old movies, to uh, tell you the things that will help you make better sound. Because Especially ones I that have want you to, yes, I want dessert you to products in it. I mean, if it's got dessert in it, that's pretty impressive. I am probably going to make go get some green jello after this. I'm I actually am. Now, I'm, I'm actually thinking now the ice cream after bringing it up. Yeah. You know what? Green jello flavored ice cream Ooh. feels like it could be a thing. That could be. That's oh. what I'm saying. 
All right, we better talk audio. Right? Uh, Marcus had a question. We're going to hit this one actually right away. Thank you, Marcus, for uh, we got a lot of folks in the uh, chat rooms and things. Brave so. people right away. They're like, right? Yeah. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a speaker question. It doesn't fit our topic tonight, but it's a speaker question, and I, I like this. Um, he has an Evolve 30M, and he's wondering: Is there any difference? Uh, is it better to use inputs five and six than inputs one and two um, on the uh, on the the speaker? Well, I would say my standard answer is it depends. If you're using the mic preamp, they're going to be the same. Uh, I don't remember off the top of my head if there's anything that's available on one and two that's not available on five and six, like, for example, certain effects or things. I don't recall that. But my uh, recollection is that all the mic pre's in terms of that are going to be the same circuitry. Now, um, five and six, I think, is the stereo channel, right? Yes. Yep. I'm looking at it right now. So five and six is... Input five and six, it has one. You push the button to have the control over both of them, mm -hmm. and then it comes down into the uh, multi uh, the multi input uh, jacks there, the XLR and the uh, quarter inch, and then it goes down into the RCA, and then it goes down into the eighth inch. So I mean, you got a lot of a lot of yeah, a lot of stuff perfect. going on so in that those. Kind of answers that that, that that was what I was trying to recall, and that's what that was my recollection. Uh, but uh, so if you have a unbalanced stereo input then yeah, the five and six might be a great option. And of course, a plus of doing that, if you have an unbalanced stereo input is you now have preserved two of your other mic preamps uh, for that purpose. So, but in either case, um, you know, if you're, if you're going XLR into the, into the mic pre, I don't think it much matters. And I, I think this is one of the, the is uh, before we went on air, I was just talking to Ben about we've been using the uh, Everse a lot and doing different things with that and practicing really with them as I'm, I'm teaching a couple of new DJs. And the Evolve 30M and the 50M have that capability of if my controller dies, if I have a cable to get from, from my laptop to that first speaker, I can run a full sounding show using the back of those mixers and do an awful lot of different things with that because it is so functional, which yeah, is it continues to impress. Um, I, 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 I continue to have to, uh, eat the humble pie because I, I didn't think that's where Evie should focus their efforts. And I was wrong. They made a great speaker and they've proven me wrong in spades. So now I just hope they get around to making the speaker I told them to make. So we'll yeah, see if that exactly. Down. For those of you wondering, this is the one that has the, the automatic, the wheels that pop down and then it has a steering wheel that pops up and it goes like 65 miles an hour across the fairgrounds. Well, it's probably a few years off, but I do huh? know for a fact they are working on one of the speakers that I, that I, uh, kind of drew up for them a few years ago and it's uh, it's going to be very very cool when it comes out so, excellent uh, well we're probably looking... probably i would guess two to three years before you'll see it uh which is you know hard to wait and watch but uh, i guess it depends on when you're watching this video doesn't it yeah, it could be you know maybe somebody who's like hey remember back in the old day when they talked about jack black that was a good show let's go watch it again you know, could be that, could be that. Huh? Right. Uh, Marcus mentions, of course, when he hooks into channel one, uh, he gets he gets a, a clipping very quickly with that. So I'm guessing he must be a gain. That's what it sounds like. Incompatibility much. there. And again, uh, Marcus, on the back of the, you know, you can push the little little kind of uh, white line button above the channel and adjust the, the volume in there or the gain there. And if you have that too high, which my boys decided they were going to do that just to show me that it could be done you're going to have problems. It's that whole yep. gain structure thing. We've done some, we've talked about that in some other shows and that's not, uh, we won't dig into that tonight because that's a topic and a half for it within itself. But um, yes. if you can go use the other one, you're probably going to be a much happier camper. So, okay. Let's talk about some of the common things that DJs do with their systems and makes us cringe. Okay. What do you got? Well, where do you, where, what do you, where do you want to start? I saw you had some notes that you had put together because I really want to, uh, you know, they're just some of the basics that when a lot of DJs are starting out and they put their tops, um, I've seen tops where they've been on, you know, taking a two-way cabinet, a 15-inch and a horn cabinet, and they've set them on the floor. And here we've got our DJ system. Or I've seen some where they set them in chairs, like they went and grabbed a couple of banquet table chairs and not folding chairs, thankfully, you know, because that would be tacky. But they've had a couple of, of and they set them in chairs. Uh, well, let's start there. Let's start there. And, and first off, you know, we, we, I think we all can visualize that and such. Let's dig into, you know, why that's not the most effective way to set up our sound system. Well, if you're having trouble visualizing it, I'm going to help you. Oh, <laughs> nice. I worked uh, very you, hard on this drawing. You did. That's, that's. In between reading articles about green jello. Yeah, of course. Um, anyway, uh, 
what we can see here is the uh, we've got our stick figure dancing man who's got his hands in the air because the DJ told him to. And he, he, uh, he, I can see right from the expression on his face, he really does not care. Does not care. And not, not a bit. One bit. Not a bit. And uh, what I've tried to illustrate here with my two-way speaker is that the high-frequency wavelengths are short wavelengths. They're smaller wavelengths. The low-frequency wavelengths are long. Uh, pardon the crude uh, PowerPoint drawing, but uh, I was rather proud of this. Yeah, no, I like it. This is exactly, this is what we need to see. And these uh, shorter wavelengths are much easier uh, to block and absorb than longer wavelengths. So by putting the speaker down on the ground, you're going to have a significant loss of clarity and uh, articulation. The high frequency is going to be uh, absorbed and blocked very, very easily. So uh, best thing is to get those tops up to uh, about head height or so, so that those high frequencies can propagate to the rest of your listening area. Excellent. And that can be done, of course, with a tripod stand or many times if you're using subs, there's a pole to go between the two. Yep. Or a rigging bracket. I mean, any, any mechanism to get the speaker up higher is going to be favorable. So having a, your, your significant other stand there and hold it all night is not a good idea. I'm just going to put that out there. Then I didn't again, say that. It could be, I, I mean, honey, you don't need a health club. You can come and lift these speakers for me. You know, we did have a young man who recently started. Uh, he is a music major at the university, uh, and he was sort of joking. He's like, as a musician, I don't really have time to go to the gym. And he worked uh, some of the outdoor concerts that we just got done doing and uh, was observing that the rest of us who do this regularly are quite fit mm -hmm. uh, and um i said don't worry by the end of the summer yeah it comes it'll get you yeah. you'll, you'll look the same yeah it'll find its way and make you looking more smelt great okay let's look at our, our next situation um this is one out I, back i remember in the the late 80s and early 90s as we were getting into more uh powerful speakers and we were getting into the trying to get the concert sound and then there was the surround sound thing that that became a thing and i've seen mm -hmm. that recently starting to kind of rear its head and what i mean by surround sound is that we have our dance floor area and djs are having speakers in multiple spots they've got their two basically kind of front that are f going towards the dance floor and then they've got two on the other end of the dance floor facing back towards the center of the dance floor so you end up having four speakers in essence in the corners aiming towards the center of the dance floor so let's dig into that. Is that, first off, giving a person surround sound? Well, uh, it is in the sense that they are surrounded by sound. Um, you know, most audio tracks are a two-track recording, left, right, so you don't have true surround information. Uh, I would call it more of an immersive sound than a surround sound. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, I don't hate it. You know, I mean... It, to me, it sort of defies the traditional listening experience of a left-right source, but but I, I don't hate it. Um, normally, I like to not have too many speakers overlapping each other with their coverage, um, but you've got a crowd out there, hopefully. I mean, you know, if you're you know playing good tunes, right? You know, but you've got a crowd out there that's sort of breaking up the sound and... and uh, I, I don't... I, I feel like I'm going to take kind of a neutral position on it, you mm -hmm. know? How far can you have a distance between your front speakers and that we've talked about time align issues and mm -hmm. the next speakers before you start to notice that they're not, they're not timed. You're getting that sound from this one, you know, a little bit later than this one. How, what is that noticeable at 25 feet? Is it 10 feet? Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely going to be noticeable at 25 and increasingly more. So, you know, it's going to really just be sort of a loss of, of uh, intelligibility or clarity at 25. And then it's going to get worse from there. Uh, they say that a perceptible difference is about seven milliseconds and it's about 0.89 milliseconds per foot. So you could sort of extrapolate that and say, well, what is that? Nine feet, eight feet, something like that, you know, but that's probably just where you would just begin to notice it. And in a, in a dance floor environment, I don't think it's going to be a perceptible thing. Uh, I think it's going to become increasingly perceptible with those increases in distances. Um, but, you know, then you talk about, you know, relative amplitude of source and that sort of thing. I, I, I feel like this one could be, that's probably not going to become a concern with a typical dance floor size, mm -hmm. you know, uh, would be my thing, you know. It might be a little bit weirder if you had, like, if you're just talking speech intelligibility, you know, as opposed to dance floor music, you mm -hmm. know. 
So I saw a concert, uh, a, a concert uh, uh, pictures from one where they had a catwalk that went out. So you had the, they had the stage with their flying speakers, as you've shown us on numerous uh, occasions. And then they actually had some speakers that were above the catwalk that were also going out to the crowd. When they're doing things like that, they have to go and have those all basically dialed in to avoid having those those kind of issues with the the sound canceling and time align issues. I would imagine. Absolutely, absolutely. That would add a whole a whole another layer of of difficulty having these these speakers all the way around. It does. The good news is on a tour like that, you often are working with the same measurements. You know, you're rolling into various stadiums, but you've got a rigging plot and you've got a layout that's generally pretty close. So once you get it right, you're going to be very close everywhere. Uh, you're going to be making minor adjustments at most, you know, so it's it's not something that they have to do from scratch every time. Mm hmm. So let's take our four speakers stands instead of having the stacks in the corners. We're going to bring them back and we're basically going to go across the front of our DJ space and we're going to maybe space them out in the library four to six feet. So there's a stack and then six feet, another stack and then another stack and another stack. Are we going to have any issues by a setup like that? Yeah, I take a much firmer position on that. I, I, I think that's a no go. Um, and, and I'll show you why real quick, actually. Give me a second to pull this up. Mm -hmm. um, so this is going to maybe be, uh, I maybe need to explain this a little bit, but uh, let's, let's take a look. So what we've got here, um, let me, let's draw some speakers in here is roughly, we've got two speakers here. We'll just say mm -hmm. that are about six feet apart. And uh, what we can see is what's happening to our pattern. And, and in essence, we have this interference between uh, our uh, speakers, and this happens to be at one kilohertz, and this would look very different at different frequencies because frequency dictates wavelength. But this is exactly, uh, you know, if you've ever heard the, the the expression comb filtering, you can see why, because it mm -hmm. looks like a comb. So that's what we've done is we've created a whole lot of comb filtering out there. And again, this being at 1K, and it's gonna be different at different frequencies. Uh, so, yeah, I take a much firmer position on don't don't do that. This is just two speakers six feet apart. Uh, and so you can imagine that would get, uh, you know, even worse if we had more of these stacks. So now if we would put the and we've talked about this in other shows, just because we're here, if we would push those stacks together and basically if we'd make one sound wall with all four stacks tight together, would we still have the the that comb filtering going on as much? Yeah, and it's gonna let's gonna do this one then. Uh, let's take a look at this. So yeah, it's it's uh, this is actually two speakers right next to each other, mm. and uh, this again is at one kilohertz. Uh, so I don't know why I'm bothering to try to write this out, but yeah. anyway, so you know there we can see this is at uh, you know one k and and at different frequencies this is going to do different things, but this is exactly again what we're seeing. In mm. fact. Uh, let me see if I can do something here. Um, this is uh, 500 hertz. So here you can see how that changes from 1K to 500. And again, and two again. speakers are tight to each other. Yep. Wow. So, you know, it's uh, it's just uh, not something we, uh, we want to do. Uh, we want to try to avoid the overlap of those high frequency horns. So if you're going to put two speakers next to each other, let's do this. Let's just go... Uh, Let's go totally uh, off script here. So let's say I've got uh, two speakers. Oh boy. Yeah, we're getting the idea. Yeah. Yep. And you'll notice that I've kind of splayed them apart. Mm -hmm. So I've, you know, kind of rotated this one out this way and this one out this way to minimize the overlap in here. That's going to help. Mm -hmm. So by, uh, by doing this, I, I uh, gain a couple things. I'm going to gain some low frequency coupling, you know, at the frequencies, you know, uh, where we would have complete summation. But I'm also going to create a wider arc of coverage. Uh, so what I don't want to do is have two speakers like this where I don't have them towed out at all. Mm -hmm. I haven't gained anything in terms of the arc of coverage. And now I have all this nasty comb filtering occurring in here. 
Hmm. And it could be, I mean, I've, I've unfortunately set things up like that before we were doing shows and, and talked about that. And I was wondering why I was having some weird times where people were like, I can't hear the microphone in the middle of the room when there's, and it's like, you're literally in a, in a spot where you should be able to hear every announcement made, but they were like, it didn't sound right. And I wonder if that was indeed the case is that it was just the right spot. Well, certainly. Cause you're going to have cancellations occur at some frequencies and, and, you know, power alleys at others, you're going to have nulls and, and then thus the comb filtering. And what I would encourage everybody to do, I think this is really good science is I would encourage everybody to go do it, not at a gig. Uh, but, but for the sake of science, take two of your speakers, put them both side by side, facing forward. Uh, probably the best thing to do is to play like pink noise. And you can usually, if you don't have a generator on your phone or a computer, you can download a pink noise file, but just play pink noise and then walk laterally in front of the speakers left to right. And you will very, very much hear that. Uh, and, and the reason pink noise is so good for this is because it's a consistent output you know, of equal energy across the octaves. So you can hear that variation in the sound from frequencies. You'll hear it pitch up and pitch down, you know, or, or perceptibly you sound like that uh, because we have these things occurring. Mm -hmm. So a really good way to see what we, to hear what we just saw. Sure. You know? And then, you know, if you feel so inclined when you got it set up, play a tune, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and, and you'll hear that as you walk around, you'll go, wow. Yeah, it's, hmm, it's not, Something. not quite right. Doesn't sound it doesn't, doesn't sound right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. Yeah, that'd be kind of neat to do. I might have to actually do that with the boys and show them uh, that how that works. I never thought about using pink noise. I tried it with a song the other day, and it didn't. It wasn't as noticeable as I was hoping it was going to be. It's like I was hoping there'd be a dead alley. No, it wasn't. Well, at certain frequencies there would be. And yeah, of course. You know, as you're walking around, then the challenge is hitting that uh, hitting that null at the time that that frequency is in the song, and you know. Uh, again, just because you maybe didn't notice in the song doesn't mean it's okay to do it. Exactly. You know? Yeah, it, it didn't make the uh, didn't have the effect of what I was after, and so but the pink noise would have done it for very sure. much. It's going to be much more plain as mm -hmm. you again walk laterally, you know. And the nice thing about that pink noise is it's playing the roughly the same sound consistently over and over again, uh, so that gives the opportunity to hear this in different places and to hear that effect. Yeah, yeah. Because I was just playing, you know, Jack Black and hoping that I'd pick it up from that, but I didn't. Okay. How, okay. how would you, if you're playing Jack Black, how would you even know? <laughs> there was that. How would how would you know if it sounded right? Yeah, oh yeah. There is that. It is an interesting. Sorry, Jack. I love it. You, Jack. It is an, it kidding. is a little video. You have to you have to get check that just out. Kidding. Okay, right. let's jump to talking subwoofers with our next one. Um, we're gonna actually, I'm, I'm gonna add a little little part of this. Uh, but first off, we're gonna talk about uh, we see DJs who don't have four. Uh, 18 inch subs or four or whatever. So they're mm -hmm. mixing different sized uh, sub boxes. So let's, let's talk about that. And then I want to jump to mixing brands from, uh, cause that many times happens also that I have, uh, you know, two EV subs and my friend has got two RCF subs and it's like, can we put them together? So let's, let's talk about sub size and then let's hit the brands. Well, I think everybody should go watch the subwoofer show we did. Um, I know you need the views anyway, John. So, you know, everybody go, go watch the subwoofer show we did. But uh, different drivers, different cabinets, different tunings, different frequency response makes it harder to achieve universal summation. Uh, so mixing sizes and mixing brands, uh, it, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It just might not be as good as you would want it to be. Mm -hmm. You know? it could it could have some undesirable effects uh but i feel like you would still gain what you're going for which is the overall summation and increase in output it just isn't going to occur equally across the whole spectrum and depending on where those subs are placed and if the amplitudes are different we could have some unintentional uh steering effects and things uh, that would cause our pattern to move in ways that maybe we wouldn't understand so I, I'm trying to think of how I want to answer that other than to say it isn't ideal, mm -hmm. but I don't think it's the end of the world. You sure. know, I don't know that a kitten would die if you did it, uh, you know, but uh, some things, some things that does happen, you know, if you do certain things in the audio realm, a, a kitten dies. Something, yeah, so, definitely. Yeah, you don't want to do that. I, I, yeah, I'm going to sort of take kind of a eh, hmm, position on it. Watch the subwoofer show. I think we'll show you a lot about the different response, even amongst 
same brands, different drivers. Uh, so we're talking about the different size or different drivers within a family. Uh, but then of course that would be similar to mixing and matching brands because we'd have different drivers with different processing, different powers, different you know, efficiencies, different, maybe everything, you know? And, and just to, so if we're talking to brand A, brand B, whatever they are, and if they're both saying that they're 2000 watt boxes and, and doing your thing, we could be putting the same signal coming you know, from our board into those two, and they may respond noticeably different. Noticeably different. So we, don't, we don't listen to watts. Watts is a measure of electrical power. And let's just assume that they are each using the same wattage measurement, but they could have different efficiencies within the driver itself, thus a different actual output of SPL. Or even if they had the same efficiency, unlikely, they could have different frequency response. So now that you know response is different at uh, different parts of the frequency. And again, I, I, I really do think that people seeing some of the charts and graphs that we put in that show, I think would would be very enlightening, you know. And that's the link that we just I just put up a few minutes ago here when Ben brought it up. So you guys can click on that link and watch it at a different time if you haven't seen that show. And if you have, well, thank you for watching it as we come through. Um, so we talked about subs at different sizes. Let's let's do go back to our tops. We talked about we need to kind of splay them out a little bit. But can we mix a 15 inch in your drawing, which I noticed you both, you had two matching speakers in your drawings. It was fabulous, by the way. Thank you. But I can, worked very hard on that. Can we have like a 15 and then put a, a 12 or, you know, some lines have a 10. Can we do multiple sizes when it comes to the tops? Certainly, because we're, we're achieving different things here. We're not combining those tops for summation. We're, we're combining those tops for coverage. So let's go to the whiteboard again. Um, let's see if I can do this uh, again. Let's see if I can, you know, really... Uh, about a thousand, so to speak. So, well, I feel it getting rougher. So here's my 15s, we'll just call mm -hmm. them. And let's say that, you know, my coverage pattern ends here, but I've got people over here. We're gonna see a lot of the stick man. Yeah. Ooh. Ooh, and they are ready to party. I can just see it. So, uh, Anyway, all mm -hmm. right. So we could <laughs> we could uh, put a uh, uh, outfill, we'll call it here, but we could put a little ten or something out here uh, to cover this area, you know. And and we're not so worried about this being different, you know, as this. Uh, that's not a problem. We do that in the concert realm all the time, um, you know, with uh, front fills and things like that. Mm -hmm. so. Now let's let's don't don't jump away here. Let's talk about that uh, because that's one of the another area I wanted to hit. Is oh you didn't need to delete that. Oh well, I I got something better if you want to talk about front fills. Oh okay, then we'll talk about front fills and later um, in, in order if you've got that if you've got something. So, so oh, I, 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 I I threw a couple of graphics together Ooh, just sort of oh, anticipating well, where you would go with this. Nice. So, uh, we're gonna well, we're gonna leave that one then for the a little bit later. And so we're. So, so utilizing the side fills, but um, if, if a person were wanting to put them side by side like you did in your very first drawing, is that would that be a possibility, or are we going to have one overpowering the other too much or doing something weird with an anomaly like that? Well, again, don't, don't overlap the horn patterns. They can be side by side, but facing different directions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it doesn't really matter, 15, 12, 10, it's going to be weird. It's going to be weird in different ways, but no part of it's going to be good. You know, you, you don't magically get out of physics jail if you just use a 10 with a 15 you know so don't have those both facing forward uh don't overlap the horn patterns and in fact very often within a family of loudspeakers the horn is the same between the 15 12 and 10 so the only difference is going to be that mid low driver uh frequency response is going to be very similar across much of the bandwidth the larger driver is a little more efficient yada 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 but bottom line don't overlap the high frequency patterns if yeah. it's a 90 degree box splay them about a 90 degrees apart and you'll be a much happier camper yep and you'll have much more coverage we don't add more tops for increased amplitude we add more tops for increased coverage good good to know you have that on a t-shirt you probably could, you know, like uh, probably, uh, you know, workshop the wording a little bit. Yeah, maybe, maybe. But, you know, otherwise, you know, if we get paid by the letter when we're printing the T-shirts, yeah, <laughs> we're good. We're good. 
I'm not sure if that's how it works. Um, I, I, I was hoping. All right, let's talk about uh, continuing on with tops. Let's talk about the pictures of that DJs have where they want to get those speakers up in the air a little bit so that they start stacking them, literally one on top of the other. Um, and I've heard someone say, look, I created my own array. And these were with two-way cabinets. They are 15-inch two-way, 12-inch two-way. How much fun is that? So... I saw this ad on Facebook, and I have uh, tried to block the seller's information <laughs> out of respect for them. Um, they say, and I quote the listing, EV line array type, 15-inch, 3,000-watt set. Also, they say $1,500 per set. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, first of all, EV does not have a 15-inch line array. No. So... That's not that. Second of all, these are not line array boxes. These are ZLX 15Ps. Uh, and I decided because I own a version of the EV 12 inch line array, the X2, 2, 12, 90, and 120, that I would make a little comparison here. Okay. Using, using the ZLX 12, not the ZLX 15. But let's boy i'm just i'm really biting my tongue <laughs> so here is the zlx on the left and here is the x2 212 90 uh, or 120 i guess we couldn't tell by the box on the right and you might say well they look very similar they look they very do. similar yeah th thank you john yeah, I was right yeah, on well, yeah 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 i was waiting for that ev has consistent branding uh and consistent look uh on purpose mm -hmm. uh and but what's notable is ZLX is quite literally the bottom of EV's line. It's not saying it's a bad loudspeaker, but saying that is quite literally the bottom of EV's line. And the X2 on the right is, is the top of EV's line. So what gives, right? Well, a few things, you know, a few notable differences. I mean, one, right away, we can see the logos are oriented differently on these boxes, kind of showing the direction in which they are intended to be used. There is that line tip. Right yeah, you know, I mean, that's sort of kind of a dead giveaway. Uh, a couple other things we'll just uh, take a look at real quick is here is this assembly is designed for flying. Mm -hmm. uh, this box is intended to fly and this solid chunk of aluminum goes the length of the box because it's designed to hang thousands of pounds safely and to angle it. There is no such device. There are not even hang points here for the ZLX. This is a plastic box designed to be lightweight and portable and easy to deploy for, uh, you know, for portable use like DJ. Yeah. Uh, this, this is not, but that's not the only difference. The structural difference is certainly important, but it's not the only difference. Um, you know, again, the, the line array boxes are designed to be arrayed as we can see here, you know, designed to create long and safe arrays. But uh, when we, we just got done saying, well, wait, we're not supposed to put top boxes together. So what gives, right? Well, good. I'm glad you were paying attention mm -hmm. because that would be a very good thing to say. Well, how come the line arrays work then if that's the case? Here's why. So on the top, we can see a cutaway of the X2-212-90. And uh, what we've got is we've got a mid-band waveguide here. Whoa, hey. No. Get ahead of ourselves. Getting the, uh, oh, I'm on the wrong thing right here. Here we go. Um, We've got a uh, mid-band waveguide here, and then we've got a high-frequency waveguide here. Uh, and what we've got with this waveguide is to prevent the comb filtering that we saw, the big wave comes in and it breaks it into these channels that cause the wave to be delayed so that all the waves, the little waves now, as you can see here, exit as one continuous wave and these go to the edge so that when we add more boxes that was really bad drawing yeah we get the everything idea. everything is exiting at the same time so this whole array is acting as one cohesive unit by contrast though if we look at what's inside a zlx we can see we've got this horn throat and here's a side view of it. you can kind of see how it's different compared to the uh, waveguide here so the distance between the acoustic centers is well outside the distance of a wavelength, you know, roughly one inch at 10K. 
Um, so there's no possible way we can achieve this. So that's why we have the comb filtering here and not here, mm -hmm. short version. Sure. Okay? Tried to say that in the least nerdy way possible, haha, -ha, you know, but, um, and also, <laughs> noteworthy oh that goodness. Evie didn't simply just add a decimal point uh, for no good reason. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there is a substantial difference. These are both the prices for the passive boxes because these are both passive boxes. So, you know, I think we have to do a little stop, a little head scratching. First of all, that $1,500 thing for the array he was talking about is utter nonsense because a single box is over six grand in the, in the touring line array. Um, and again, it has a lot of things involved there. The, the quality of the drivers, there are two high, high frequencies and one twelve, And then of course the rigging hardware and the R and D and the software, yeah. all that goes into it. Um, so I guess more of the story is don't do that. It's, it's not going to work. Go back to our Warshack drawing. We looked at earlier. It's going to sound terrible. It's not going to give you a line array. There's no cheating physics in this deal. If you want a line array, you need a purpose built line array box. And I think, I don't know, seven, eight years ago, you and I did a show on line array and uh, it's worth a watch too. viewers go back and give that a look because we really dive into the physics and mechanics of what makes a line array a line array, mm -hmm. not the least of which also being the number of boxes in the array dictates the frequency down to which an array acts like an array. So if you hang, even if you take this box, the X2 and you hang three of them, you don't have a line array, <laughs> even though you have a line array box, you don't have a line array. So, um, it's just, just physics, I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. so. Excellent. <laughs> I think that'll actually eat up a couple of our next couple of questions because we talked about, I think, yeah, the laying out. So let's jump down to the, uh, let's talk to the, about the mini column, uh, speakers since we've been kind of talking about, uh, about the line array. Um, some people, you know, are saying that the mini columns, I can get, I can get a decent sound, but I need to have more horsepower. And they've been trying to add other speakers, whether it's subwoofers, which I don't want to get into with this specific spot. We'll start with the adding top speakers, uh, trying to get more coverage or more uh, sound pressure using a top cabinet with our our uh, mini column speakers. Yeah, same rules apply. So now we've added a column array and a point source box to each other. Again, that doesn't get us out of physics jail. Uh, don't overlap the high frequency coverage areas. You're not going to achieve what you think you're going to achieve. Uh, you could use them together, but in the same types of scenario we looked at earlier where they're not pointing at the same place. So if you need to add a coverage area, yes. If you're trying to add amplitude, no. Uh, you're, you're, you're just at odds with physics. You're going to create an acoustic mess. Uh, you know, and, uh, I, there's just, there's just no way I can put a stamp on that and say it's recommended. So this is one of those moments, like we talked about it early on in the show. If you came here for affirmation, you're not going to get it. If you tell me it sounds great, I'm going to just quietly judge you. <laughs> so I'm gonna say, no, it, no, it doesn't, you know? Uh, and, and to be blunt, it, maybe you just don't know the difference. And, uh, you know, those are probably some really harsh words. And again, I'm sorry if I hurt anybody's feelings, but I I'm here taking my time to help you. And, and the only way I can do that is to give you the honest answer and say, no, it, it, it doesn't make it better. And if you think it does, then, then we need to have a discussion about that. So, <laughs> so don't do it, please. Um, uh, not if I'm in the room, cause I don't want to hear it. I don't want to, don't want to experience it. Um, for, for those who are, they, when we're talking about uh, the dispersion, the width of the, the audio throw, there's generally a difference between what our mini column arrays are going to give us for coverage width wise and a traditional two, uh, two way cabinet. Can it kind of give us a, 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 an idea of what those differences would be? Well, a couple things occur in a column array. It works very similar to a line array. It's the same, essential physics you know we have a number of drivers that are interacting together as a singular source and when we lengthen the array vertically we actually widen the coverage horizontally uh, but these things are also typically engineered for a really nice wide coverage uh, so we're going to have typically you know 90 degrees on a point source box like a two-way and we're going to very often have 110 to 120 on a on a column array um, Again, there's some there's some physics that goes into this. Some of these use waveguides. Uh, the Evolve 50 uses waveguides, and I believe so does the new Maui 28G3. 
Uh, so that's going to help preserve the linearity of the coverage across the pattern. Um, but, you know, there's every engineering is always a series of compromises, you know, uh, you can, you know, trade off SPL for musicality or linearity and, you know, engineers have to go through all these gyrations to say, well, what's the compromise we want that gets us the best of everything, mm -hmm. you know, and of course, within a price point, right? Because as we saw just a minute ago, EV makes a 12 inch speaker that's 450 bucks and EV makes a 12 inch speaker that's over $6,000. Yeah. And you can bet they're not the same. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I've used both and I'll tell you, they're not the same. Certainly. Yeah. <laughs> not not even expect close. them to be. Yeah. No, of course not. I mean, that would be ridiculous. I mean, all of us who bought the $6,000 ones would be idiots if that were the case. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, it just painted a great big stupid on my forehead, but <laughs> you know, that's, that, that's, it's, they're, they're worth it. They're actually a fantastic bargain, you know, for what they do. Mm -hmm. um, and that, it does make them better than the $400 speaker, but it doesn't necessarily make them better for every application. I don't use them every gig. That'd be silly. Mm -hmm. uh, I also own a whole bunch of EKXs and I use those all the time. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. For the gig. Yeah. That's a big, big part of it. So um, we talked earlier about the top speaker being on the floor. So we talked about the too low, but how about on the other extreme? Is it possible to put a top speaker too high or inappropriately place it up in the air wrong for an application? Yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, when we're talking about an infinite space, uh, you know, you could certainly put it too high, uh, you know, where maybe it wouldn't be effective in terms of SPL. But I think now I'm being a little bit silly with physics. Uh, let me see what I've got in my little bag of tricks here. Um, let's take a look at this. So there we go. What we can see here is a is a top that's elevated. And uh, this graphic actually was to illustrate the difference in arrival time between the top and the sub, but I think I can use it for this discussion here. And we can see that we've angled this top down. The simplest way to describe good audio is point the loud part at the people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we say, well, this is the, this is the business. Whoops. Hey, hey whoa, whoa, what's going on here? This is the business end. Uh, and we're going to point it at the uh, stick figure down here. Who's obviously not having as good a time as he was a minute ago. Yeah, but anyway, no, that's He's, he's, I don't know, he's like, whatever, man. Well, um, I, I'm guessing that the Jack Black song is over and there's this part of disappointment that nothing following that could be as good. Exactly. He's yeah. he's slumped into a, a deep, uh, you know. Sadness. Uh, yes. Sadness. sadness yeah. after. Mm -hmm. he's, he's like, play something I can dance to. Anyway, so, uh, yeah, and, and, you know, of course, you know, I was a DJ for, you know, 15 years. I mean, every time somebody would say that, I'd be like, wow, I never thought of that. What a great, yeah, what a wow. great idea. I should play something people could dance to. Well, how come I never thought of that? That's weird. Anyway. New thing. You know, thanks for saving mm -hmm. the day. Mm -hmm. Anyway, <laughs> boy, I tell you what, my sarcasm is really coming out today. You know, put, put me out on a couple of tour shows over the weekend and look at me look getting at all you getting, out little, yeah. getting a little Ready crotchety. Scrap here. Make sure the kids stay off the lawn, man. That'll be... <laughs> so a couple advantages to going up high, and that is that uh, by doing this, um, you know, I can, uh, let's find, let's go blue my distance here and my distance here are not as dramatic as if my speaker was here so you know the difference here might only be you know 3 db difference as opposed to here it might be a 6 db difference oh, or sure. more yep i see what you're saying so this this helps plus this speaker is going to be about minus 6 db oh that's hard to write uh, when I get to the edge of the pattern. So this might actually work out to be pretty much even, you know, just because I, I'm, I'm losing 60 B because of the distance here, but I'm losing 60 B because of the pattern here. Uh, and so it works out to be about the same across the listening area. Mm -hmm. So, you know, could be some real advantages. Now, like to your question, could I get too high? Yeah, I suppose you could, because, you know, if this thing gets higher and higher, the angle is going to have to get steeper and steeper and, you know, at some point, it probably doesn't make any sense anymore, you know. Uh, now, certainly, we do speakers overhead in gymnasiums, things like that. Uh, but I, I, I think that from a portability standpoint, from a deployability standpoint, there's probably a point where it just doesn't make a lot of sense anymore. And I'm kind of reticent to put a number on that right now, but I think we kind of get the idea. Right, where yeah. 
getting higher could be problematic. So you, of course, mentioned, you know, pointing the loud part at the people. Now, are we talking in this situation, are we visualizing that the wolfer is the, the loud part? Or are we wanting to have that tweeter, in essence, be the loud part that we want to make sure is aimed at the people? Well, both. Because really, let's just say that there's an acoustic center of this loudspeaker that encompasses both of those. Mm -hmm. You know, we shouldn't hear the tweeter over the woofer and vice versa. If the loudspeaker manufacturer did their job, we should hear full bandwidth sound coming out of the acoustic center of that box. So when I say point the loud part at the people, I'm basically saying the front of the loudspeaker. Sure. You know, that's, it's not like we have to worry about this as opposed to this. We're splitting hairs here. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, if we really wanted to get specific about it, we could probably assume it's in the middle, you know? Mm -hmm. And just kind of had that aiming towards our sweet spot and off we go. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, and in this case, we can see that this uh, speaker, oh, goodness, could not color inside the lines. We can see that this speaker is not pointed directly at the person. Uh, and uh, the reason for that is this is simply an illustrative graphic, right. you know, um, because, again, knowing that my pattern is going to vary slightly at the edges maybe that's what gave me the best coverage. You know? So now in this situation, if a person were standing literally in front of that subwoofer, you know, a foot in front of that subwoofer, what, let's say, mm -hmm. they're probably potentially missing some of the highs that are not being diverted down towards them from this application or this picture. Correct. Okay. Which uh, really is a good thing to think about as we start to think about our front fills. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we engineering is a series of compromises. Now, again, the pattern does not stop at whatever the vertical pattern is. It just begins to uh, become less, um, you know, as it gets down here. So they're probably still going to hear some, but we might need to uh, adjust the uh, tilt of the speaker to your point. You mm -hmm. know? So, yeah. Do we want to jump into the fill uh, talking about front fills? Sure. Let's let's, let's jump into that, and we can come back and uh, talk about placement of subwoofers, or maybe we were going to run out of time. I, that, just, let's talk about the fills. I think that's an important one. So those those opportunities when we are playing to a little bit lar lar larger crowd, and we do you know have our tops up like that, which for many people is doable uh, with with their gear. But then we were, as we just demonstrated or just diagrammed, there could be a somewhat of a dead spot in front. Yeah. Let's. Uh... I'm, gonna, I'm making this up as I go now, mm -hmm. but let's go, let's do this. So let's say this is the horn pattern we saw earlier. And in the horizontal space, when the speaker is oriented as the badge on the front of it looks, you know, so when the speaker's facing upright, if that's the way it's intended to be used most of the time. Yeah. Now, some of these do have monitor cuts and things that allow you to use them on their side, you know, but let's just pretend that right now this has got 90 degrees of coverage in the horizontal plane and maybe 50 in the vertical plane. Mm -hmm. uh, so if we look at uh, these two speakers, um, this is supposed to be a top-down top, top down view, but obviously I can't draw a stick figure in a top-down view or he'd just be like a circle, right? Yeah, so, that, yeah, that wouldn't look... To, and you'd never see exactly how much they didn't care was, as they were waving their hands. In yeah. The air. So that's what's going on here. We've got these two speakers, and uh, you know my, my coverage patterns do not cover where my person is standing. Mm -hmm. And they are so what? sad and upset that they lay down. Right. So a couple things we could do here to solve this. One would be we could tow these speakers in a little bit because maybe we don't need the coverage out here on the sides. Uh, or two, we could add some front fills. Uh, now, in most DJ scenarios, this is less of an issue. Uh, but in a concert, this is much more of an issue. And we do have front fills because the arrays are hanging out. You know, the stage might be 60 feet wide. Mm -hmm. uh, no way you're hearing the, the, that PA 60 feet apart if you're in the front 10 rows, you know. So we put speakers down on the stage or on top of subs in front of the stage or whatever. But right down in front, we put speakers that are called front fills that are designed to fill the front. Mm -hmm. Now, is there anything special with... with uh trying to avoid the the combing uh, that we were talking about earlier when it comes to front fills or is it one of those things that there's just going to be so many bodies there you really don't worry about it it's a little both uh you know obviously we don't put all the front fills right next to each other they are spaced apart as well uh there's still going to be some comb filtering and some phasing at certain spots 
the good news is it's minimal uh, because of the spacing. And unless you move side to side, you don't hear it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're sort of counting on that. Sure. Like, that well, makes sense. Yeah. You know, one, don't make it as dramatic as putting two speakers side by side and, you know, and, and two, count on people who can't move across the aisle. But if you do during sound check, if you walk left to right in front of a stage, you can hear it. You'll notice it. Yeah. Um, yeah. It shouldn't be disruptive. The sound should be good for every seat. These are the big money seats. So mm -hmm. it really has to be good there, you know. Yeah, that would be you want to make sure you're doing the job again, mm -hmm. making sound, making good sound and continue making sound or no, I don't remember. The... Make sound, continue to make sound. And then when possible, make, make good it. sound. There we go. Yeah. I knew there was a third one. So. Actually, that's taking us right to the end of our time tonight, Ben. That went oh, quick. All right. Well, good deal. Yeah, that, that, went, that went really, went really quick. and had some good information there. Uh, good information indeed. Uh, up next, uh, you go to djntv.com slash chill tonight. Uh, Jay and Brian and Howie and, and John are going to be in there, I believe, tonight uh, talking with the Tuesday Night Music Show. Uh, you can join them. It starts in about 10 minutes. Again, djntv.com slash chill. And uh, you guys can hang out there and have some fun with that. Um, talk about uh, talk about green jello. Yep, exactly. Talk about presidents of the United States of America because oh, uh, that, they sang tea. the real peaches. I, I was hoping actually it was going to be Jack Black singing that. I was. I, I could go for that. And I I, I, for I, that one would have been kind of fun to see. And, and I, I do like Jack Black. I just, I just, I, I just. Yeah, you, I, after you watch the video of him singing peaches to the Mario. The character. No, I, I, re I remember because my son went to the movie and he showed me the video clip. And oh, I, so you've seen it. All right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah I, it, it sort of all came back. It was sort of a thing I tried to forget about. Yeah, it, it, it might be back. one of those moments. Yes, you wanted to definitely do that. Oh, Danny has a question. Danny, thank you for the question. Uh, ideal distance for her sp spacing the Evolve 50s without having to tow them out away from each other. Yeah, again, noting that they have a 120-degree horizontal pattern, uh, I would say eight feet or so is probably the minimal number and you're still going to hear a little bit of that phasing you know in the very front center overlap but it won't be very much won't be as bad um you know and again the, the good news is the solution is simply to tow them out you know it's a very easy fix mm -hmm. here again a uh, little science fair you know go uh take them out and play with it a little bit give it a little try and see what uh, happens yeah absolutely give you a chance to uh kind of really hear what's going on Yes, and the neighbors absolutely love hearing Pink and Noise played at a high volume. It's just incredible how much they're like, yeah, love this song. It's my favorite jam. Yeah, it just goes. There, so. uh, once again, thank you guys for being with us tonight. Uh, we'll be back in July. We've got For the summer, we're doing one show a month, so we'll be back for a July show and an August show, and then we'll get back to our regular weekly schedule after Labor Day. So, uh, Ben, thanks for coming in tonight, and we will see you next month. Sounds good. Thanks, right. John. Thanks, everybody. Good night, everybody. Bye-bye. Oh. <laughs>